I'm an active check writer in an environment like this. The fact that we've seen uh, reasonable moves in commodity prices, both precious metals and industrial materials, without a concomitant move in the equities, uh, tells me that the equity markets, from the point of view of a speculator, a patient speculator, uh, that this is a good time to be deploying. Uh, and I guess that's what I'm doing here. High metal prices, rising tide floats all boats, but obviously you're more discerning than that. Uh, what are some of the, your golden rules for filtering the companies you invest in? Well, Paul, I'll tell you, it doesn't float all boats because most of the juniors don't have any metal. They're looking for them. Uh, in my career, so many investors have said to me, back in the days when I was a broker as an example, if the gold price goes up, uh, how will that impact the, impact the shares of you know, amalgamated moose past your gold mines. And I try to say as gently as I can, if the price of something that you don't have any of goes up, it shouldn't really impact your fortunes too much. So it's important to differentiate that too. I think it's important as well in the junior sector to understand that most of the juniors are subscale. Uh, most of them are so small that general and administrative expense uh, consumes most of the capital they raise. Those companies are doomed to fail. We've talked about this before, Paul, but uh, I suspect that three quarters of the juniors that are public worldwide, Australia, Canada, the United States, Great Britain, are valueless, absolutely valueless. That disguises the fact that maybe 5% of the issuers generate so much performance that they add legitimacy to a sector where 75% of the listings are valueless. What I'm doing, of course, is looking for that 5%. If you start with a group that self-selects to be at a conference like Beaver Creek, and you try and find the best 25% uh, of 200 who are probably already in the best half of the issuers, it's a target-rich environment for uh, a speculator like myself. When you start that process, Rick, do you focus on the geology? Do you focus on the balance sheet, their, their GNA burn, their cash? All of the above. Uh, I'm 71 years of age, so one advantage that I have is that I have a very deep, now called contact file, it was called Rolodex when I was your age. Uh, and one of the things that I'm looking for are familiar people, people who have been successful before in a task very similar to the task at hand. Or I'm looking for a strategic investment by somebody who I have co-invested with in the past. So for me, uh, I, I guess it starts with people. So it's the, the power of networks. Yeah, I mean, I want somebody to be a demonstrated success, and I want their, their prior success to be applicable to the task at hand. Someone comes to me and he says, well, I was successful. I operated a gold mine in Archean terrain in French-speaking Quebec, but the task at hand is exploring rather than operating for copper gold in tertiary volcanics in the Peruvian Altiplano, Spanish speaking. The success isn't necessarily germane to the task at hand. So I want specific success, success germane to the task at hand. And for me, everything that can go wrong with a big mind can go wrong with a small mind, but a small mind can never make you big money. So I do want scale. I care a lot about the property. And I, I care about having in situ value of at least inferred being at the sort of two and a half to three billion US dollar range, preferably bigger than that. So I look for that. Uh, I would say my competitive advantage here at Beaver Creek is I'm much more agnostic to perceive political risk than most of my competition. Many of my competition won't go outside Ontario and Quebec. And for me, I'd much rather take perceived political risk than I would technical risk. I want a good project before I care about the jurisdiction. Let's look into that a little bit deeper. Um, gold price at $2,500 per ounce. It's moved from $2,000 to $2,500 in a relatively short space of time. One of the key conversations in any transaction is the relative valuation of the parties. Uh, gold price going up $500, relatively short time. Company A's share price might have gone up 10%, company B is 30%. So you, you've got a disparity that has to be resolved if a, a transaction's uh, going to proceed. Uh, will the gold price affect the ability of M&A to occur? Uh, the availability of capital will impair M&A over time. 
time. Understand survivorship bias. You have two entrepreneurs who've built two companies. Both of those people want to be the survivor and only one can be a survivor. Most of the deals that I've seen that haven't taken place, haven't taken place not because the benefits to shareholders of the acquired company weren't sufficient, but rather because the benefit to the management wasn't sufficient. So you have to overcome survivorship bias. Uh, I think that's probably more important. I don't think it should be, but that's a different question. I think it's probably more important than the metals price. Uh, if, if companies have the ability to access capital on terms that they consider to be reasonably attractive, they have no incentive to participate in a merger. So I think it's important that you understand management incentive in the context of GNA. There will be situations where the attractiveness of the transaction is so apparent and there's so much room in the valuation that the, the team that doesn't survive can be compensated uh, because the acquisition is so appealing. An example would be the, rec the recent uh, acquisition uh, of Reunion by G Mining. Uh, both management teams knew each other for a very long time. The G Mining people did a wonderful job of discovering the deposit, advancing the deposit, but now came the hard part, the mine building team. They knew the Gignac family for 30 years. The Gignac family have experience in mine building in tropical high rainfall environments. It was a perfect, perfect, perfect merger. And just this week, they put out a PEA, a preliminary economic assessment on Oco West. Um, so that looks like it's going to go forward. Are there any, who, who would you say are the prime candidates for M&A? What, what are the deals that you know, are crying out to be, to be made if everything else being equal? Well, since we're in Guyana, uh, the other part of the Oco West deposit G2 Goldfield. is G2. Yeah. Uh, and the G2 guys, high quality people, high quality deposit. Uh, if it isn't one deposit, it's certainly one mineralized event. Uh, so the most obvious thing that I can see out there is uh, obviously G2 um, into something uh, involving their next door neighbor. Uh, obviously, Goldfields would like to play a role in that somehow. There's a blocking stake, which is very smart by G2. They've introduced some dynamic tension. But I, I think that needs to happen. Uh, as a uh, as a G mining shareholder, and as a Lundin Gold shareholder, uh, I would love ultimately to see Lundin Gold uh, take on all of uh, G two Reunion uh, and G mining again, because the Lundin family has done business with the Gignac family for twenty years. There's no cultural uh, impediment to a merger. Uh, and so that seems to me to be something that could work in the longer term. Well, G Mining built the Fruta del Norte uh, right. mine of uh, Lundin Gold. And they did a superb job. And the CEO of Lundin Gold, Ron Hochstein, was instrumental in securing the Lundin family investment in G Mining. So there's... History. Yeah, there, there's a lot of history and, and there's a lot of potential for synergy that, that, and I'm not trying to say that I have any information that it might occur, but if we're allowing ourselves to fantasize, uh, you take uh, Lundin Gold in that circumstance or whatever the resulting company would be uh, to two tier one deposits with uh, global production in excess of a million ounces in the bottom cost quartile worldwide in the highest return on capital employed worldwide, it would be a very formidable very formidable com company. London Gold's in a very interesting position at the moment. It's a single asset gold producer. Yep. It's just cleared all its debt. It's one of the lowest gold costs, it's one of the lowest cost gold producers. So the free cash flow is incredible. It's just increased its dividend, um, but it still has that single asset risk. Yep. It has the country risk aspect with Ecuador. Diversifying would be a good thing for it, but with such a high grade asset, where does it turn? Well, I think it'll be, as you would suggest at the beginning of the discussion, uh, is it accretive for Lundin or is it not? Um, there, you have a CEO who is very aligned with shareholders because in this particular case, the shareholders have their name on the door. Uh, and Ron Hochstein, superb guy, 
has worked with the Lundin family for 25 years. He's an absolute loyal to shareholders, which is not ubiquitous in the mining business. So a transaction is an example that, and I'm speculating again, saw uh, Hochstein elevated to chairman uh, and some other younger management team, say G Mining, uh, fulfilling more of the management roles. And, uh, and people shouldn't read anything into this discussion. We're having an educational Speculating, discussion. yeah. But it's that type of deeper dive into strategy that's involved in M&A arbitrage. Uh, and there wouldn't be objections to a transaction, I don't think. Uh, and if you had a sponsor like the Lundines that are very large shareholders and would have the ability in uh, an amalgamation announcement if more capital was required to write a lead order, um, those are all things that contribute to successful mergers. You know, I think if you go back further with Sentimen, when uh, Endeavor tried to take them over, there you, I think you had a very clear case of survivor bias. Uh, you know, Endeavor had just done a deal with Semifo, so they weren't prepared to push probably as hard as they would have had to push with Sentiment. But I think you saw the real objection there being the Sentiment people wanted to be the surviving managers. I think that's what got in the way of that transaction. And I, I, my suspicion is that the institutional investors at Sentiment forced this last transaction. I think sometimes this can produce some very interesting results. I'm thinking back a couple of years to Kirkland Lake Gold, yes. when they had to, saw the moment to expand and they bought D2 Gold. So they come from a, a very high grade asset base to a, a low grade disseminated. The market instantly hated that. In, yes. in the moment it hated that, but that's proven to be a very, very good acquisition. It was a great acquisition. I think the problem that you had there is that the market was speculating that somebody was gonna take over Kirkland. And the shareholders that populated the Kirkland shareholder base uh, hadn't anticipated that they were the, the acquire or they were looking to receive rather than pay the premium. <laughs> now, for me, that was very useful because I was able to be in the backside of that trade. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was lovely. When you have uh, a whole bunch of people that are exiting a trade for reasons of their own preference rather than arithmetic, that's a great place to be a speculator. Okay, now let's wrap things up, Rick. Um, how do you think the rest of the year will play out in the gold space? I think there will be some continued disappointments in the sense that investors look at the increased gold price and they think that producing company margins should expand very rapidly without understanding that the input costs have also escalated. Uh, energy costs have moderated, which is a good thing. But the social take, which is to say taxes, royalties, uh, off concession expenses, things like that, are increasing, I understand, at about 15% compounded. Uh, labor costs are going up. The parts of spare, price of spares is going up. Finished steel is going up. And I, I think there will be continued disappointment among investors about the fact that the margins, the producing margins, aren't increasing as fast as one would hope, given the increase in gold price. So I, I think that there's going to be it's going to be a positive environment, but it's going to be tempered for the balance of 2024. My suspicion is in 2025, all other things being equal, it'll be a pretty good year.